Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Person. I am the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, and Manchester Center, Vermont. Thank you so much for your incredible loyalty and support of independent bookselling for the past um, stretch of time. Um, we really couldn't have gotten through these last couple of years without the incredible loyalty and support of customers like you. So thank you so much for making the choice to shop local and shop independent. Um, please make use of the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions um, throughout the evening. I will be posting by links to both of tonight's books in the chat, and you can also use that to say hello and uh, let us know where you're uh, signing in from. I am so thrilled tonight to welcome Derek Bas Baxter. He joins us to talk about his debut book, In Pursuit of Jefferson, a book that Publishers Weekly called an entertaining and informative chronicle, and Kirk is called a wise, readable, and altogether satisfying work. He studied history at the University of Virginia and made nine separate trips abroad on Jefferson's trail. He will be interviewed tonight by Doug Mack, the author of Europe on Five Wrong Turns a Day, and more recently, The Not Quite States of America. He has written for Travel and Le Leisure, National Geographic Traveler, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Please join me in welcoming Derek Baxter and Doug Mack to our screens this evening. Hello, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. There you are. I was looking for Derek. There you are. Hello, and thank you for for thank you all who are here um, for joining us. Um, should I just dive right in? Is that how we should do this? Derek, do you have any preamble before I begin? Uh, no, no. I'm happy to uh, just jump right into it. That sounds right. fine to me, Doug. Wonderful. Um, so tell us about your background with Thomas Jefferson for people who don't know that. Um, where did this all start? Sure. Well, I will even uh, I will even uh, try to share a screen here that will that will make it all come clear. Um, so, but but I but I go back Jefferson and I uh, go back a ways. You know, I, I grew up here in Virginia and. Uh, you know, he, he always seemed present. I'm sharing, but do you see the, the PowerPoint now? We're not seeing the PowerPoint right now. No, it's a Word document. Oh, okay. Well, let me, let me, let me go back to that. I'll just, I'll just tell you a little bit. Um, I'll try to get the PowerPoint back on. But, uh, uh, you know, I've, I'd always been fascinated by Jefferson of, you know, growing up in Virginia, he seems almost omnipresent. You know, they, uh, I think Faulkner, who taught at UVA, wrote that they, they spoke of Jefferson as if he were in the next room. And he always appealed to me as a child uh, of all the founders as, you know, the most energetic, the most uh, uh, interested and interesting, you know, this Renaissance man who seemed like he could do it all. And his commitment, you know, his commitment in writing to equality also interested me uh, quite a bit. So, uh, you know, I, I came across this guide that he wrote about traveling through Europe, and that really appealed to me because, uh, you know, I came across it a, a while back. I was kind of uh, about to turn 40, kind of thinking through my life. I think I was looking for a big challenge of some type, and uh, Jefferson had written this unpublished guide to what to do in Europe, where to go, you know, subjects to investigate, and it just really appealed to me. And given that you know this was my you know this is the founder that especially at the beginning of this trip i really saw as this hero uh it just seemed like you know here here is my life's quest laid out for me so i wound up following this guide over uh many years over 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 a long period and uh and got to know got to know a lot of things about jefferson about europe about ultimately i think about myself on the journey yeah, yeah, it's it's a long and and winding road, um, both for Jefferson, um, the, all his travels, but then also for you through through his travels and through your own experiences in his footsteps. Um, the book opens in Bordeaux, right? Um, and actually, I should say, I should back up before that. I think you had said that you wanted to uh, um, give us a little reading um, from some of the some some of the background. Do you want to go ahead and do that? Before we move sure. on to, to Bordeaux, sure, that sounds great. Um, 
I'll give you a, I'll give you a reading. Um, I am attempting against all hope to to share my screen again. Are you able to see that? Go. Yep. The PowerPoint. We are in PowerPoint now. Excellent. Um, it's not full screen, but uh... yeah, I, we'll try to get it to to be full screen. Um, so. Uh, I'll get, yes, I'll, uh, we can talk more, uh, I'm sure about, uh, about the guide if people are interested in the specifics of, of where he went, you know, that's Jefferson in France at the time. And that's a bit of the itinerary. And, and if people are interested, we can dig in deeper. This is me, uh, literally gazing up on Jefferson, um, <laughs> I love him. but, uh, but one thing that, uh, you know, following this guide of his, he, he went all over France, he went to the Netherlands, he went through Italy, uh, various countries, but really one of the highlights for Jefferson was uh, his trip to Bordeaux. So Bordeaux, as uh, most people know, um, if you know anything about wine, if you if you see this, uh, this map, you know, it's where we've helpfully placed this wine bottle and glass there in the corner in the southwest of France. It's the most exclusive wine region in the world. Uh, and this was a place that was really important to Jefferson. Um, he loved wine. I was a little surprised to find that out because he's a very serious guy. Jefferson, you know, he's not cracking a lot of jokes in his travel journals or anything like that. He's not like Benjamin Franklin or, or John Adams, even with the sarcasm. He's, he plays it pretty straight, uh, but he loved, uh, he loved wine. And there are many reasons. And so I go into, so I did research and I found out why. There's many, there's economic reasons, there's cultural reasons why Jefferson really wanted to learn about wine. Um, and I won't read from that, uh, but I'll, instead I'll read you um, a different part of the book. But, but suffice to say that he wanted to know about it and you know, good wine was not being made in Virginia or, or, or in the US at all. It was being made mostly in France and Germany and Italy. And there weren't printed guides like there are today. Uh, you really had to, if you wanted to know about wine, you had to do like Jefferson, you had to go out there and go directly to the vineyards and try wines out and talk to people. So that's what he did. Uh, so I write about, so uh, I found out, it, you know, traveling to Bordeaux was going to be a big challenge. And they don't just let you in to these vineyards in Bordeaux. Uh, I couldn't just knock on the door of the chateau and say, I'm here writing a book about Jefferson's travels or, you know, experiencing the travels. Uh, please let me in and taste your wine. Um, uh, they're very exclusive, but there's one day of the year where they do open the doors, which is every fall, they, they run a marathon through the, the Medoc, which is part of, of Bordeaux on the, on the left bank. And they, uh, the Chateau do open the doors and they have give you tastings of wine as you run. But, but one of the catches is, as you can tell from this picture, you have to run in costume. So, uh, so I dressed up as Thomas Jefferson and my wife as a colonial woman and, uh, we did the marathon, but we weren't we weren't super runners. This is our first marathon, so I'm going to do a brief reading from the very end uh, of of the marathon. So at this point, we're tired. Uh, it's a very hot day. We're in costume. You have to complete the run in seven hours, uh, and there are these three runners called the sweepers who are running along at that exact pace. And if you fall behind them, you're basically out of the race. The gendarmes will find you. And we saw this happen to somebody and they, they take you away uh, and you're out of the race and you lose your prize and everything. Uh, so I'm, you know, we're trying to complete the race. I'm also thinking a little bit about the history and, and particularly about uh, one of the young men who was following the guide when it was first written way back in 1788. Uh, his name was William Short. He was Jefferson's personal secretary, basically his assistant in, the, in, uh, in Paris. And William Short was traveling through Bordeaux and was going through a lot of questions himself about what he should do with his life. So with that tee up, here is my reading. By now, the small sips of Bordeaux no longer dull the throbbing in our knees or the blistering on our feet. And even the mild whiny buzz has disappeared. Ale, Liana, call out the spectators who look concerned. Her name is on her running bib, but I wonder why she's garnering such attention. Then I see that she's as bright red as a nice Cabernet Sauvignon. Despite all the pageantry and wine, it's still a marathon, our first, and doubts about this whole expedition creep in. How would it bode for any plans of following Jefferson's guide if we fail on this inaugural leg? We walk briskly. I know we're north of six hours into the race, closing in on the seven hour limit. 
A tent with the flag proclaiming kilometer 38 is a welcome sight. We're on the home stretch and it's time for the most famous stop on the journey, a table piled high with heaps of mottled oysters. A man with a proud white mustache and sun brown arms shucks them at a snail's pace. I drink white sauterne poured from a plastic water bottle. It tastes different from everything we've had before, tropical like lychees and passion fruit. Jefferson loved this sweet wine so much that he would order it his whole life, sending bottles to George Washington as a present. The lush sauterne almost puts me in a trance. If only I could lie down, stop running and drink some more, preferably listening to sitar music. I reached my hand out for seconds. Liana shouts to me from the edge of the tent. I can't hear her, but manage a gallic shrug, smile weakly and take another swig. Liana looks upset as if she had eaten a bad oyster and points dramatically at a hill as if to say, J'accuse! I follow her finger, high, cresting a distant hilltop 100 meters ahead of us, run the three sweepers. Behind them, a gaggle of runners practically cling to the trio's capes, begging for penance. The sweepers and their acolytes disappear over the hill, crushing the juice from our dreams. We're about to be placed in a van and hauled back to the starting line. My hints to Americans test run a failure. On Monday, I'll be back on the commuter train, getting to work by nine for another week of sameness. Just like those Bordeaux wines, I'll be confined in a classification that's impossible to break out of. My mind flashes to Jefferson and to William Short and the advice he sought from his mentor. He too traveled to Bordeaux with a troubled mind torn about his own future. Should he remain in Paris long-term or follow his dream of running for office back home in Virginia? He was afraid that if he chose wrong, he'd have to resign himself to a life he hadn't wanted. Consider carefully, Jefferson counseled in a return letter. He would be sorry to lose short as his secretary, but the young man had to find his own path to durable happiness. It won't be easy. It will certainly involve hard work. This is not a world in which heaven rains riches into any hand that will open itself, Jefferson wrote. Whichever of these courses you adopt, delay is loss of time. The sooner the race is begun, the sooner the prize will be obtained. Man, I feel an almost electric jolt course through me. I'm not ready to abandon this race, this prize, this pursuit of happiness. Without a word, Liana and I rush forward, revolutionaries storming the barricades. We put pain out of mind. We charge up the hill, surprising the British Romans, sweeping past the sweepers. On a runner's high, blisters and heat forgotten, we clock our fastest kilometer as the Grand Gironde River comes into sight. My cape flies crisp in the wind, our hearts pound in unison, our minds drag our exhausted bodies behind them. Ale Liana, she's purple like Merlot and determined. Loud French music blares, people clap. The clock ticks seven hours, we cross the line holding hands. We finish the marathon, and now the hard journey begins. <laughs> I love that. It's it's so evocative, and um, it really sets the tone for the book. Um, although the tone does shift, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but it, it seems like you, at least you started off having just like a lot of fun. Um, you write about um, the objects of attention in Jefferson's Guide, yeah. um, which which I believe did not include vineyards, um, but did include some other things. Uh, what are some of the other highlights, or um, either the objects of attention, or or other sort of things that from at least in the in the first part of the book, in, in the lighter part of the yeah. book, let's start there. Sure. So so here. Um, it's a good question. Here, here are the here are the eight objects of attention. So Jefferson, you know, he he wrote this guide for these two young Americans that were going to travel across Europe uh, in their twenties, and he didn't want them just to be out on a lark, you know, have a big vacation. You know, he hoped they'd enjoy themselves, but he really wanted them. He gave them homework to do. He wanted them to learn about Europe along the way and and find good ideas. He was he was very practical. He wanted to find ideas that we could take back home to America, which were just, you know, the Constitution had, 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 had just been written, you know, it was being ratified, you know, America was coming out of the revolution, its economy was in trouble, we're trying to build the first, you know, large republic in the world, or at least in many, many, 
uh, years. And so uh, he had high hopes for this trip. He put a lot of pressure, I think, on these young men. So he gave them these eight subjects, um, every, everything from agriculture to learning about mechanical arts and, and particularly architecture. That was one that he said was worth great attention. Uh, wine, as, as you note, Doug, wine is, was not one of the official objects, but he, but nonetheless, right. Jefferson kept writing about wine in this guide. He, I think he listed 13 different wines that he wanted them to go in person to learn about. So I gave it kind of an honorable mention and there was a lot of wine involved. But um, but yeah, it was it was a really it was a, it was a very fun, rewarding journey. I, I broke it up over years. I didn't do it up all at once, and instead, uh, I would go normally with my wife and uh, often with the kids, um, maybe every summer to try to investigate a different one of these subjects and, and go to a different place in the guide. Uh, so so you asked about some different uh, different experiences along the way. Um, this is Amsterdam, uh, where we visited on this festival they have called King's Day, which celebrates the Royal House of Orange. And Jefferson actually, uh, we, we, we timed our visit to, to go to this festival because Jefferson had been to a very similar celebration of the Prince uh, of the House of Orange. When he was there, he had to wear orange and he wrote about the fireworks. Uh, so it was here in Amsterdam that we really learned about, I think Jefferson's practical travel tips, which I can get into if, if we're interested. And how he liked to travel, but here in uh, this is this is Stowe in England, where the big theme was landscape gardens. Uh, Jefferson thought gardening was a really important art. He, he saw it as an art form, landscape gardening. This was a big deal. This was kind of like the Instagram of the day. You know, this is how wealthy, you know, well, you know, uh, people of means showed off in, in a way. Was uh, you know with 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 this elaborate landscape. And he, and he loved English gardens. It was pr probably the only thing he liked about England uh, while he was there, but he, he loved the garden. So we went, it's a bit of a controversial trip we, because I decided I had to visit all 19 gardens that he wrote about, which was not universally popular uh, with my kids and um, we can't blame him really, but we did it. And uh, this was much more popular. This is a trip, our trip to Italy, to the Northwest of Italy. Uh, Jefferson wrote that he was on a continued feast through Italy and was very interested in looking for both foods and crops to bring back that, that uh, could be grown here. So here we are in, a, in an artisanal pasta factory near Naples. Uh, Jefferson got a macaroni maker from Naples. He also had a whole run in with the law in, in terms of smuggling rice, which is a fun story, which, which I'm happy to... Uh, to, to tell later, but uh, in terms of other places and we went and things we did, this is me and a codfish uh, in a French uh, auction house in Brittany. Jefferson was also very interested in natural history and in the practical side of science. And he was promoting fishing and whaling as our minister, as our commercial minister in France. And so he did a lot of investigating about that and he went to different French seaports. So there was a whole, um, so I have, a, I have, you know, very, we had various adventures on the trail of science. And then a whole other theme is architecture. Uh, that was probably the most, the, the thing that Jefferson was most interested in seeing as he traveled. Uh, this, um, in fact, I'd be curious to see if anybody in the chat has any idea what this building is that I've, this, this picture that I've got up here. Uh, if so, feel free to drop it in. But I've asked, I've asked this a few times, and it's, I almost always get blanks. It's a, almost a trick question. Um, but believe yeah, it or not, uh, this is Monticello. This is the version of Monticello that Jefferson had designed before he went to Europe. He just designed it from books. Uh, it was the best he could do. But it was only uh, years later, after going to traveling through France and and Italy and seeing different examples of architecture, including this building in Paris, which looks a lot more like the Monticello you see today. Uh, you know, it's got the dome, it's got skylights. He, he found uh, the right building materials. Here I am in, in Carrara, Italy, where he got this uh, elegant form of marble that he, that he incorporated in some of his design ideas. So, uh, so, so, so as I said, we took all these trips in turn and tried to learn about his different objects of attention as he called them. Um, and, uh, and kind of learned a lot about these subjects along the way. Do you happen to have a photo uh, of the final design of what was built? 
of Monticello? Yeah, to refresh yeah. everyone's memory. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that is Monticello. As, as you can tell, it looks a lot more like the Hotel de Somme with with the dome. Um, it's very elegant. He he did incorporate marble in some touches, like in a marble chimney piece that he asked uh, his his secretary William Short to uh, commission for him in Carrara, Italy. Uh, but but then he used the but he also had his own ideas and he used uh, he used brick, which which was a great building material to use it in Virginia, you know, with all the red clay we have here. So, uh, so he, it was kind of a, comp so Monticello ultimately was a combination of a, several different ideas that he, he found in his time in Europe and also just his own vision. So I, I, you know, I had seen, I've been to Monticello ever since I was a kid, but I just really having seen some of those original buildings in Europe, it just, you know, they look so much different. Monticello looks so much different coming back to it. Yeah, I mean, it, so really, it sounds like Monticello is is sort of a, a travelogue in its own right, in the sense that it, it this is very much inspired by Europe, inspired by his travels, and sort of bring back all these different ideas and filtering them through his American mindset. Yeah, that's that's I like the way you put it there. That that is a good way to see it, I think. And it's with with the architecture, but not just architecture. If you, I it, I mean, Monticello is almost impossible to imagine without. Uh, Jefferson's time in Europe because you have exactly. a completely different building. You have the landscaping that he changed after he came back. That's when he put in a lot of the ideas that if you visit Monticello today, you're going to see. He had already placed it on top of the mountain, which was obviously a very daring uh, choice already. But in terms of some of the contrast he had between the, the wild woods, which he left in the base of the mountain and the pastures on the top, you know, those were things that kind of definitely fit the mold of the English landscape gardening that that he had uh, he had seen over there and um, many things you see in the interior I mean you can see objects that he brought back from Europe uh, but 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 kind of a bit of my bigger thesis as I learned more and more about Jefferson was I don't think he would have I don't think we'd be visiting Monticello today uh, and remember him this way if he hadn't had this his this time in Europe um, his he had really uh, his star had fallen quite a bit before he was able to go over there. He had, uh, his wife had, had died, his, he, he had resigned, he had not resigned, but he had left as governor at the end of the Revolutionary War, kind of in disgrace. He was a dark place in his life. Uh, he wasn't the kind of quite the same famous accomplished Jefferson you think of later. People didn't even know for the most part that he had written the Declaration of Independence. I found that fact interesting. That, that had kind of been kept under wraps in the early years because the Congress just wanted to say, the Constitutional Congress wanted to say, we all did this, this is the unanimous, you know, this is the, the this is what the people of the United States have, have come up with. So he wasn't this famous author of the Declaration of Independence. He was kind of a bit of a, in a bit of a, a bad place uh, uh, and in a dark place. And he, he actually wrote about suicide. Uh, he hinted at it in a letter to a friend. So it was these trips to Europe. His trip to Europe came right after that. It it revitalized him. It gave him all these ideas that he brought back, but I think it just gave him uh, gave him more of the confidence in, that he would use in his political career afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's probably a, a good segue, um, you know, talking about Jefferson's troubles and uh, how going to Europe maybe mm -hmm. had, had sort of a restorative effect on him. But but as, as you went along um, in your journeys, um, I don't want to say the opposite happened, but certainly there's a there's a turning point in the book. Uh, and one of the things that, that's really striking about uh, the book, I think, is how you you offer these very humorous scenes and these gorgeous travelogue descriptions that are so evocative and so beautiful. Um, but it also gets it gets quite somber as you start to piece together more of the history. Um, I, I do want people to read the book um, because you put it together so beautifully and you manage these different tones so beautifully. Um, but I'm wondering if you can give us just a, like a little preview of a particular moment or scene when your perspective on Jefferson started to shift. Well, uh, yes, yeah, so there, there's obviously this extremely difficult uh, and painful issue kind of behind the scenes in any story of Jefferson, which is slavery and his involvement in slavery, which, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, ignorant about this coming in. Of course, you know, he's a slave owner. Uh, I thought I thought I would just separate out his travels in Europe and it should just be a great blast to, to do that. And, you know, I could kind of, the slavery issue is certainly not one in which he, he, he comes out looking looking well, but I didn't think it would necessarily, you know, uh, 
I didn't know how related it would be to all these travels, but it turned out it was very related, at which I found out as I went on. And asking about a particular moment, particular moment, I think it was really looking into the architecture in particular, uh, because I got really excited seeing all those buildings uh, in France and Italy. There's a lot more that that you know I don't have time to show all the pictures of, but to kind of get all these ideas and piece them together. And I came back and saw the many buildings he built here in Virginia, especially UVA, the University of Virginia. Um, but you, but looking into it, you realize, well, he built it, but he, but by building, by building it, he really designed it. And it was enslaved people that did so much of the work. Uh, and even particularly at UVA, there was, you know, Jefferson didn't, didn't want the slave cottage. He, he didn't, he didn't draw in the slave cottages. He thought the enslaved people should, should live in, in like in the basements of the professor's buildings at UVA. And, uh, they kind of just weren't part of his his plan. Um, and I realized more and more that, you know, enslaved people were a part uh, were, were part of his journey. He didn't actually travel with an enslaved valet in Europe, but it was the tobacco being picked by slaves at Monticello that paid for these journeys in large part. Uh, is all these projects I talk about, not just architecture, but the other ones, agriculture and, uh, and gardening and, you know, you name it, uh, manufacturing. He came, he came up with the plan and, and, and enacted it to, to have young teenage enslaved boys at Monticello make nails. Uh, so, so all of these kind of came back to, to the, the issue of slavery. And, and I, I, I felt like I needed to and wanted to learn much more about that. And, uh, and I spent some time kind of diverted away from following Jefferson's travels through Europe to instead choosing to learn about the lives of, of some of the enslaved people at Monticello, uh, including uh, this man, Isaac Granger, an enslaved uh, tinsmith, uh, and and Peter Fawcett is another one. I, I He has a fascinating story. Uh, Peter was, his last name was Fawcett, but he was a, he was a member of the Hemings family. Uh, and his father, uh, you know, the Hemings family did have uh, somewhat more uh, privileges than, than some other enslaved people. They didn't have to do the same hard labor in the fields. And, and Jefferson only freed formally seven out of the 600 people uh, he enslaved. And they were all Hemings, including Peter's father, Joe. But Peter was not, was not freed on Jefferson's death. Um, he was sold at auction because of the great debts uh, that Jefferson had. And he was only 11. And he wound up being sold to a new master who was particularly cruel, who who whipped him, who forbade him to read. Uh, he tried to run away, was caught. Uh, eventually, Joseph Fawcett, with, with the help of some other friends, was able to purchase his freedom, and, and the family moved to Ohio, where Peter became, he worked with the Underground Railroad. He became a very prominent caterer and reverend. And there's a story that I love that a, a Monticello historian has undercover, un uncovered, which was about how, you know, the contrast between how Peter was sold at the age of 11 on Monticello's West Lawn, uh, but then he, he returned to Monticello as an old man. By this point in time, the Levy family, uh, a Jewish family who was bought, had bought Monticello, they're very inspired by Jefferson's commitment to religious freedom. Uh, and they welcomed Peter back when he was an elderly man. He got to walk, you know, he walked right through the, the front door of Monticello. So, so what, what, a, what a trajectory for him. So I just found that also very, very valuable. And, and I realized that, uh, you know, Jefferson, we see the gulf between his words and his deeds, and, and people say, well, he was a creature of his times, but you also know that Jefferson, of all people, uh, knew about equality, and, and, you know, I certainly had wished that he had followed the, the lead of some other slave owners in, in Virginia who did free their slaves, including Washington, so it's, it's, it's certainly a tough chapter in Jefferson's history, but I think it's also slavery, learning and remembering slavery is, is important. And it's a way also of remembering all of these other hundreds of people that lived on the mountain and shared it with him. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, yeah, I think you, you really managed it beautifully. And I, I assure anyone watching that there's far more to this than, than Derek is, is telling you right now. Um, so please, you know, definitely get the book, read it, um, because it, it, there are so many stories here um, with many, many layers. Um, I wanted to go behind the scenes. And I, I know that, that when we were emailing, you said you, you didn't actually have a, a lot to say about your approach, but I'm wondering, um, mm -hmm. just sort of shifting gears, as a writer who has tried to manage these things myself, I know it can be incredibly tricky to try to balance, you know, quirky travelogue with, with this deeper history that, that is, is often very tragic. Um, 
are there are there writers that you look to when you're trying to do that or um uh, tell us just just try to get us a little bit into your mindset of, of how you sat down to to try to make this work in the book yeah well you know i just kind of wrote about the kind of the mood that i was feeling on these travels um you're right i mean parts of the book i you know they were like a joyous experience for myself and my family and we're we you know we're 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 out there and we're meeting people and learning about things and doing things like this marathon and i just i kind of wrote that in the style that uh that i felt uh at the time um and i you know i was kind of looking looking up at you know at writers like like bill bryson who who write you know uh write about travel with 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 some humor uh but the the passages, the chapters I wrote about the lives of the enslaved people, I mean, I was kind of writing my reaction to that, which, you know, obviously, you know, humor is not appropriate there. And I just wrote it. Uh, I still wrote kind of, uh, I, I, it's, it's very personal, including, I include a lot of, you know, the whole book is personal. It's kind of half history, half travel. It's kind of half Jefferson and half me. So I continued to write, I think, in the same style with just, just, just without humor, but it's the same personal style. And I kind of grappled with my own personal life story a bit in those chapters and kind of thought about about me and how I got to where I am uh so it is it is somewhat different but I guess I just tried to kind of be honest to my feelings you know in the in these different parts of the book yeah yeah um yeah I guess I guess that's and that's a good point is it, it is it's always you there it's always you know there, there's a feeling of immediacy and um, you know humanity and, and and personal story um, that that really grounds everything and, and ties it all together. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Bryson because you know I, I he he is very very funny. He's somebody I admire too. But you know in in a book like A Walk in the Woods, for example, there are places where you know he has to he, he talks about environmental degradation, for example, in, in Walk in the Woods. And so I think it's it's always important for travel writers to to be a little bit realistic and not just you know get lost and and be goofy all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, you know, kind of, um, you know, to give you the chance to weigh in if, if you want, Doug, uh, you know, I know in, in, you know, in the not quite states of America, you're both doing personal travel, but you're also thinking about uh, the histories of some of the territories, you know, you visited. So, I mean, I'm sure you've also probably given thought to how, how do you, uh, how do you blend both the story you're in in the moment and then the story maybe of the place you're visiting, which might have tragedy in its background or just, you know, it's, it's, they're complicated stories and they're hard, they can be hard to tell, I think. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, I, I'm sure that you ran, ran into this too, but, you know, for, for me, um, a big issue was knowing that I don't have an infinite amount of space, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are a million things, a million uh, personal stories that I hear when I'm on the road reporting. There are a million emotions that I have. There are a million mm -hmm. um, pieces of history. Uh, that, that just can't make it on the page just because yeah. you can't include everything. Um, are there particular things that, you know, if, if you had another 200 pages, um, <laughs> are there issues or pieces of history that you wish you had space to include? Well, I think my editor would have killed me if I, <laughs> I don't think I would have gotten 200 pages <laughs> more. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that is, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there's so many stories out there, but at some point you've just got to like find the through line in the narrative. And, and that's the story that you have that you go with. I mean, we did a lot of travel that, you know, that didn't always make it up on the page for sure. Uh, um, and there were kind of, kind of vignettes along the way that, that kind of didn't make it in or, or things we would have liked to have told more, but that's the thing about travel writing, you know, maybe 10 things happened to you that day, but one of them kind of links up to the, the message of the book and the other nine are really interesting and fun. And that was a great lunch we had, but you know, that doesn't really fit, uh, fit in this story. So I've saved, I mean, I've, I've written a few, uh, a few blog posts about some issues, you know, they're on my website. So I have a website, uh, it's jeffersontravels.com, uh, where I put a few of those things up there, like kind of some stories that didn't make it in or some issues that I wanted to explore more, but it didn't really, didn't really have the space. Um, but yeah, I went on deep, deep dives and rabbit holes on a bunch of different issues that never got it in. But, but I felt really, uh, really grounded uh, when I did write about them. Um, 
I mean, I think, I don't know, I, at one point I probably had 30 pages written about fishing that I included maybe one or two at the at the end because that's what really the any more would have bogged down the story but I but I'm glad I knew where those one or two were coming from so yeah it, it's always it's the iceberg right it's it's mm -hmm. the the depth of your knowledge is not necessarily apparent to the reader but it's there and it, it's forming the shape of the story um yeah yeah it's it's such a it's such a challenging thing um I had a perfectly formulated question a second ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I was gonna, I was going to say um, I, you know I, I always wish that the books, especially travelogues, which are just so so rich in detail, um, and they come with commentary tracks. You know, like like a DVD. I wish you could oh. the button and and let, let the author you know get, say you know on this page I actually you know I'm, I'm telling you this, but here's what was going on the rest of that day. Here are the other nine things. That happened. Yeah. Well, I do. I do have uh, endnotes. So I have endnotes, mostly, um, mostly giving sites for the different historical quotes I have, and kind and if, but but occasionally I'll, I'll throw in a, a few little anecdotes here and there, and even a joke or two in the endnotes just to see if anyone's still reading. Um, but that's a that's I did a little bit of that in the endnotes, just in terms of okay, here is, you know, here's you know when when I you know, here's where we went that day type thing. But um, but there's only so much you can do. And you're right, like like an actual for real travel junkies, some kind of uh, some kind of like, uh, you know, uh, description like you had would, would be fun for sure. Yeah. One, one thing actually along those lines that uh, I didn't get to get into in the, in the book at all, except maybe a sentence or two was Jefferson actually went to Vermont, um, not as part of these European you know, travels obviously was when he came back two years later, he traveled with James Madison uh, through New England and stopped in, stopped through Vermont. And uh, my family, like in between our European trips, we went up there and checked out some places he went to. He, uh, the big place being Bennington, Vermont. Uh, he was very interested in the Revolutionary War battle that had been fought near there. And he, he was also, he was also kind of scoping out some local leaders. He was trying to, he was at the very early stages of forming what became the Democratic Republican political party. So he was looking for allies and talking to people, but uh, you can still see the house that he he visited there in uh, in Bennington, it still stands. Um, so there's some cool connections. And he was also very interested in maple sugar and uh, and in, uh, in, in, uh, in sugar maple trees and, and, and cultivating them and tried to bring them back to Monticello and, and grow them without much success. But he actually getting back to, you know, for Jefferson's faults as a slave owner who, who you know, was not able to free his slaves, he did, especially in his early years, push for at least gradual emancipation. And, you know, he was, he had those, that's why he can be such a perplexing character to figure out. Uh, he's a slave owner who's calling for abolition and yet not, freeing his own slaves. Um, but that was one thing he was interested in maple sugar. And he talked to people in Vermont all about this was could, could that be a good alternative source of sugar? And then uh, the, the Caribbean sugar islands that were just had a brutal form of slavery, you know, they, they wouldn't have to do that. We would have an, another market. We could get away from the Caribbean sugar and produce our own. Uh, and Jefferson was very pleased. He said he would, it, would involve, it wouldn't involve slave labor at all. It would only involve child labor. So that's a whole other issue, but I, we probably don't have time to unpack that today. No, I, I don't think we do. Um, I, I, I wanna make sure that we have time for questions, but if, do you have any other photos that you wanted to show us before we move on to questions? Um, no, I think that's fine. I think we can just go into it if, if people have any. Yeah. Sure. So we did get one question that was uh, DM to me anonymously, which was someone asking, can you tell us more about traveling the, these journeys with your kids? Yeah, it was, that was a real kind of rewarding part of it for sure. The kids were very small when we started on, um, they were, I think something like, like 14 and 11 or something by the end. Um, and they went on several, several of the big trips. Um, so it was, it, it was great. I mean, obviously we were traveling a little slower and I was, I kind of worked it in where we'd have like a Jefferson day and then a non-Jefferson day. Um, but, uh, but they learned a lot and I, I don't think I fully realized just how much they, they learned about travel and love travel until later uh, because they were, they were still pretty young, but, but when they got to be a little older, they, 
and, and, you know, even today they'll talk, they'll look back and say, oh, you know, I can't believe that trip we took to, to, to Rome and that was so amazing. I mean, these are like bucket list experiences. Um, and uh, my daughter, I think, came back, especially from the Italian trip, really interested in food. She loved Italian food, you know, you can't blame her. And she started cooking, even though she was, uh, I guess she was only about 10 at the time, but it, it was sometime after that, that she really got into cooking different dishes, especially pasta. And my son, Un geography fiend. He like loves geography. Came back home just like reads maps. That's that's a big thing. So I think that's like a lifelong love right there. So it, it was really fun to share it with them. I'm glad. I'm certainly glad they've been. You know, they were a big part of the trip and kind of seen it through their eyes. You know, I you know I include some of the some of the things they said from time to time on the trips. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, this next question comes from David. He asks, I had been under the impression that Jefferson traveled with Sally Heming Hemings when he was ambassador to France. Were these trips that you're talking about separate trips later on? So she didn't travel with him on these trips. So so she, she came to France uh, in 1787. Jefferson was there from 84 to the end of 89. So she came uh, partway through uh, uh, traveling with, with uh, Jefferson's younger daughter. Um, uh, Sally's older brother James was there the entire time. Uh, so she was, yes, yeah, she so she was there in Paris for those two years, two and a half years. Uh, and she she experienced Paris. She did not. So he took three long trips away from Paris. Uh, that was the basis for the this guide. Uh, and she didn't go on those. No, neither did James. Interestingly, I think. Uh, I say interestingly because normally James or his brother Robert served as a valet, the enslaved valet for Jefferson back home. He wouldn't travel without without them back home. But when he took these big trips, he didn't. I'm not sure exactly why. Well, part of it was James was studying cooking, uh, and part of it was maybe some psychological thing. Was Jefferson trying to? He, he was traveling like as a private citizen. He wasn't even traveling as a diplomat. So maybe this was the one time of his life where he just kind of out by himself on the road. I don't know exactly. But but no, uh, Sally didn't go on those three trips. So the, and the three trips being to the south of France and Italy and to England and to uh, the Netherlands and Germany. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Angela. She would like to know, how did you first become interested in Jefferson? Yeah, I'd always loved Jefferson. So I grew up here in Virginia and uh, I just always, you know, I went to it as a kid. I went to Monticello. I went to Colonial Williamsburg. I just, I, I love the reenactors and of all of them, I just, I just, I think I was just entranced by this idea that Jefferson could play the violin and he could invent things and he could write and he was a lawyer and he was this and that. I mean, it just went on and on. I just thought this is like, uh, I think that was the thing that just, just really spoke to me. Um, so that was that was the part I I, I first you know was inter, you know first admired about Jefferson and I think the thing that I, I I you know I see him very differently now I think that I've learned a fuller picture of his history but I still do admire the kind of visionary part Jefferson had he, you know he was a big proponent of public education he pushed really hard for that and uh, in Virginia and successfully and and of religious freedom you know he was way ahead of his time he pushed hard you know against you know, the Virginia state legislators weren't really sold on this at all, but Jefferson and James Madison uh, got a very early strong bill guaranteeing the right of religious freedom in Virginia um, because we had a state established church here. Uh, so, you know, so on some things like that and on science, I think, you know, Jefferson really did, you know, really did, I think, look to the future. So that's what particularly interested me. Thank you. Um, Anne would like to know, did you get any sense of how Jefferson is seen by the people you encountered on your travels, even though he's a historical figure now? Yeah, I mean, I was surprised for, that people had a view of Jefferson, even in Europe. I kind of thought, well, he's our guy, you know, but they like uh, talking to English people. I remember an English woman told me that Jefferson was was her favorite president, which surprised me. I didn't know that they had favorite, favorite presidents, but I mean, why not? We have favorite queens or whatever. So uh, uh, and the French too, the, the French, you know, who's He's, he's quite well known in France. He's kind of like Benjamin Franklin. He's like the symbol, uh, one of the symbols of America and kind of Franco-American relations there. Uh, so I did get some reaction. It wasn't like a blank slate at all when I told people I was over there uh, curious about, uh, to find out about Jefferson. But it's I, I think it's fascinating how Jefferson kind of lives on. I mean, he's he's been dead for 
well over, you know, he's been dead for a couple of centuries almost. Um, but, uh, but people, politicians quote him, you know, on, on all sides of the aisle, you know, and, and you know, he's, it's, it seems like, you know, people want him to be president kind of uh, weighing in so much because I think he was kind of there. He kind of wrote what's been called our American creed. You know, he kind of wrote our mission statement as a country. And so we keep looking back to him um, and, he's keep, and he keeps being reinterpreted over time. So, uh, so yeah, many different opinions of Jefferson along the way. Um, this next question comes from James, and he asks, were there any places on Jefferson's itinerary that just no longer exist or were massively damaged, perhaps during the World Wars, mm. or were incredibly hard to find? Okay. Uh, well, all of the above. Um, uh, I, I think, I mean, they, they actually, actually, you can find all the places he went to. Jefferson was an incredible note taker. I mean, it depends on how good you are with your GPS and driving around, but but he, he wrote down, he was an obsessive note taker and he wrote down every expense he had and he wrote down every place he went to. So, you know, so you can track it. You know, I went to a ton of places he went to, but I mean, if you, you so I loved it in, in one place, even just way out of the way, um, uh, just north of Provence. It was a minor little town. I didn't even include this in the book, but just driving through this tiny little town and finding this Roman bridge that he had gone over in his carriage and he just noted in his book. And I was like, there it is. I can't believe here I am driving on my rental over this, this small town on a Roman bridge that, that Jefferson did. It just, stuff like that blows me away. Um, but uh, yeah, some places in the, in, you know, in the, in the north of France and in, in Belgium in particular were, were certainly damaged in the war, um, the Avra, where he sailed out of, was was heavily bombed uh, in World War II. Uh, I mentioned my kind of quixotic idea to see all of these landscape gardens that he had seen, and a bunch of them were like beautiful gardens, like the one I showed in the pictures. Others are not gardens at all. They're like they all had some greenery, but some were just like a small little park, like you might see in any town anywhere or in the suburbs anywhere, um, just like a random park that was just a, a little fraction of what had once been a huge landscape garden. So it was interesting to see the, the how, kind of how some places survived through time and, uh, and, some, and some didn't. Um, so that was a fascinating part for me. And that's what I would recommend to people uh, traveling is just to have, uh, to have some kind of meta purpose or you know, some, some mission. It doesn't have to be following you know, something quite so grandiose as I just did, but when you're going out there, really it kind of pushed me to get out of my comfort zone and go to some places I hadn't. I'm sure it did for Doug as well. He actually did something similar uh, following the old Fromer's Guide from what, from the 40s or 50s going around Europe, uh, which also kind of you know, lets you see the world today and kind of contrast it with what what went on before. So uh, just whatever that purpose is, I think it, it adds like an, a little extra something to your travels. If you have some, you know, some mission you're on while you're doing it, even if it's just a fun mission you've made up. Yeah, and it takes you to places that you wouldn't see otherwise. Absolutely. Right? My, and I are, are fans of that style of travel. We actually, many years ago now, went on a Benedict Arnold road trip. Um, and oh. you can see amazing places that you would never get to visit. Um, which actually wow. brings me perfectly to the next question, which also came in anonymously, um, asking, are there any Jefferson sites that you haven't visited and will you continue now that the book is out? And if not, do you have a new quest? Oh, okay. Well, there are, there are certainly Jefferson places. I didn't make it to everywhere he did in Europe. And I had one big blowout trip planned to hit the very last sites. And this trip was planned for the summer of 2020. So uh, we never made it. And instead, uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but we found a different way to travel and in the book um, instead of this last thing. But, but the, one, the one thing that I, I, I would have liked to have done on this, on this trip was the Canal du Midi, which is this canal. It's a canal system that goes basically links the Mediterranean to the Atlantic uh, coast of France. So it kind of slices through that, that part of France just above the Pyrenees. Uh, you know, just to the northeast of the Pyrenees. So it's a, it, Jefferson loved it. He, he was just floating along very slowly on this canal boat, kind of listening to the bird song, recording what the birds were, recording the crops he saw, kind of daydreaming. Uh, so you can do that. You can, you can get on a canal boat today and uh, kind of tie it up at night and go to the, the nearest village and have your dinner and then go back to your boat and sleep on the boat, which just sounded ideal. So someday I still hope to do that. Um, but I think I think but this book is done. This book is this book is 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 
is is out and uh I am I am starting another quest, uh, which I'm not quite ready to pull the curtain down on, but I think it's also gonna it's another travel history uh, journey. Fantastic, thank you. Um, that is all of the audience questions oh, that we have had come in. So I wonder um, if both of you could finish up by telling us a little bit about something that you've been reading recently that is fabulous. No fresh. Um, so I guess the last book, I, the book I just read is uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which is really interesting. Uh, I don't know if either of you have read it or any of the readers, um, but it kind of, it's, it's about this, this ancient manuscript and it's part of it takes place in Constantinople and in, in, Ute, in like Idaho, I think in, in 2020 and then part in the future. And, and, and they're all grappling with, with different, uh, different uh, parts of this text and it just really well structured, beautifully written. Uh, it kind of, it, and it's about libraries and it's about books and bookstores. So it's about preserving stories. So I found that just a great read and, and very inspirational. Um, one of my favorite books of late is a travelogue. Uh, I read a lot of travel. <laughs> um, it's uh, called, I believe it's called Every day the river changes. Um, it's, it's about the, the Magdalena River in Colombia. And there's a, a young travel writer. He was, uh, he started, he, he did the first part of the trip um, when he was still an, an undergrad. Um, and he's only a few years older now, but he's very, very good. Um, and it's about, like I said, it's, it's this river in Colombia that was um, for many, many years a very important waterway um, that, you know, important for commerce and culture and all these things. And over the years, for various reasons, it has sort of fallen to decline. Um, and he starts at, at the source and he goes through um, and he, it's just full, uh, again, as with Derek's book, it's full of incredible history, um, amazing characters. It's just very, very evocative travel writing. Uh, the author's name is Jordan Salama. Uh, I believe that's his name, but every day the river changes. Fantastic, thank you. Those are some great recommendations. And I actually just finished a great travelogue too called Riverman, an American Odyssey, which is um, about a solo canoeist who canoed on his own thousands of miles of American riverways before going missing in 2014. And then the journey of a reporter trying to piece together what happened to him. So that's my, my travel writing recommendation of late. Um, but Derek and Doug, this has been a really fascinating evening. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Audience, thank you for being with us. You can order both books at northshire.com. Those links were in the chat earlier and also will be in your confirmation or email from this event. So you can order both books and you can also, while you're there, check out other great events coming up. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great night. Great, thanks for having thank us. Thank you. Good night. Good night.